Hello and welcome back to the show. Now, many of you will know me as Harry, the Arsenal fan, but I am a football man first and foremost. And on this brand new segment, we're going to be bringing you interviews and features with some of the most recognisable names in the world of football and sports broadcasting. I've got another fantastic guest with me today, and we're going to be talking about his career. We're going to be talking about the careers of others. We're going to be talking about Spanish football. If that doesn't give you a hint who it is, then I don't know what will. But kick back, sit back, relax, and enjoy. Welcome to the podcast, Mr. Jerry Armstrong. How are you, sir? I'm great, Harry. Thank you. I'm looking forward to having a chat. I cannot tell you how grateful we are to have you on the show. We really, really appreciate it. I know you're really busy. And so, of course, you know, I just want to say thanks, uh, first of all, for agreeing to do this. Yeah, my pleasure. And uh, it's always nice talking to people uh, who are involved in sport all over, well, all over the country, all over the world. And um, I'm, I like everybody else at the weekend. I'm watching my football, but I'm watching my golf. And I'm watching. Uh, well, it, it was the All Ireland um, football semi-finals in Dublin as well, and Tyrone were playing Kerry, and Tyrone got beaten. So it's a, it's going to be Kerry versus Dublin in the final which is uh, the 1st of September. So you're looking forward to that then? Yeah, I'll, I'll keep an yeah, eye on well, that. <laughs> yeah, it's well, always, it's always good to watch, good entertainment. Good stuff. First of all, Jerry, how pleased are you that the, the football season is back? Yeah, well, I've missed it, you know, and it's great. Um, I had a couple of uh, international friendly games in the summer that I was working on uh, for um, uh, Premier Sports. But uh, it was it was good because you get a chance to look at the new signings, and of course, Atletico Madrid was the one I was really interested in because they they lost Godin, and uh, he, he had uh, and Felipe Luis. A lot of players had retired, a lot of players had left, like Griezmann, and we're wondering who's going to come in and replace them and how they're going to how they're going to fit in. And um, they spent like 270 million in the summer. Uh, Simeone, which is a lot of money for Atletico Madrid, and they played some brilliant football. They look a real threat to Barcelona this year for La Liga. Yeah, you, so you expect them to be challenging at the very top again. Uh, you know, Real Madrid have spent a lot of money as well, but for me, you know, Simeone's got that core there, hasn't he? He's already got that sort of base work there, and it just needs yeah. a bit of tweaking, doesn't it? Yeah, well, he signed Hermoso, who's a popular centre half, and he had a great season last year, Spanish international with Espanol, and he slotted into the middle of the defence. And uh, they already had Savage, and you know they they they've um, they signed this kid called Jao Felix, and you're going to be really excited by him because he's only 19, and he signed from uh, Benfica for 128 million, and. I thought that's a lot of money for a 19-year-old, but when you watch him play, you can see he's an attacking midfield player. But then at the weekend, I covered the game on um, on Saturday, and it was Atletico Madrid against Juventus, and he scored both goals for Atletico wow. Madrid. This kid, he played up front, so he can play up front if he has to, and he can play in midfield, and he's just great to watch. He's a fantastic player. He's going to be a big star for the future for me, the Portuguese international, and uh, that's exciting news for La Liga. I definitely look forward to uh, to watching that uh, closely and, and keeping an eye on him in particular, Jerry. I want to start off by talking about your career, though. Um, so, if we go back a little bit, um, I understand that you started playing Gaelic football initially. So, how did you end up finding your way into football? <laughs> I played Gaelic football initially as a boy and hurling. That was the two sports I played in Ireland at the time. And um, I played a little bit of soccer in the street, but never played for any teams as such until I was about 16. And uh, then I started playing a little bit for local teams, um, St. Paul Swifts. And um, my school team had asked me to... um, to help out because a lot of players in 1969-70 the internment came into Northern Ireland and a lot of the players were arrested. So um, I uh, decided I would try it for the soccer team for the school and uh, I, I got in and they put me in as a centre half so I played centre half for my school team when I was 16 and uh, we went on to win the cup uh, that year which was which was a bit of a surprise and um, then uh, I went back straight to my Gaelic football and, and hurling days and I got suspended playing uh, Gaelic one day and I got a ban I got a ban I was fighting and um, I got banned for four weeks I was just about to was, ask you what you did <laughs> <laughs> well I was fighting Harry to be honest and, and Gaelic football was quite rough and ready then and uh, you know when things happened on the pitch it would be quite spontaneous two players would stand up and punch each other you know so anyway I got I got suspended and uh, basically I ended up uh, having nothing to do for three or four weeks 
so a friend of mine went to look for a match one Saturday afternoon and uh, we went to where Crummy Galbian who are a very good amateur league side they were playing and the manager hadn't a clue who I was I didn't know him and uh, he didn't pick us for the game and I ended up playing as a guest for another team who were in the same league and I did I did really well and scored a lot of goals that day so the manager of the Crummy Galbian team called Sammy Watson he asked me if I'd I'd come and play for them the following week so I did but I only played about three games for Crumb and Galbian and uh, Bangor Football Club in the Irish League spotted me the manager was Bertie Neal and Billy Neal was the assistant and the two of them saw me playing one day and asked me to come and train for for Bangor and I went and started playing for Bangor and played about three years for Bangor before I signed for Tottenham Hotspur and that's where my soccer career started Wow Inter- really interesting story it's kind of like you accidentally fell into football um, I did yeah <laughs> brilliant brilliant stuff I'm an Arsenal supporter so you know the Tottenham thing we'll, we'll put that to the side for a minute um, well I have to tell you <laughs> see I, I was negotiating with Arsenal for um, a couple of months before I signed and I thought the day I was going to sign I thought I was signing for Arsenal really but when I got there it was Terry Neal and Bertie Mee was the manager of Arsenal at the time yep. I don't know if he was a little bit slow in, in the movement of it and uh, but um, it was Arsenal I had had a lot of discussions with and I hadn't heard from Tottenham for about three weeks so I didn't think there was going anything was going to happen but when I arrived at the hotel um, Terry Neal was there and he was the manager of Spurs at the time and he signed me so I did think I was going to sign for Arsenal but um, I ended up signing for Tottenham Wow, that's it. Your career is full of interesting stories, Jerry. Uh, full of them. Uh, for me, I, I was doing some research, obviously, prior to this interview and, and looking sort of into your background a little bit. And yeah. you've spoken about the way you kind of went into football and that you were primarily playing Gaelic football initially. Do you feel, yeah. though, that the late start that you had in football was a disadvantage? And, and sort of how did you overcome that? Um, well, it was when I, I ended up with Tottenham and I started practicing in the morning with the, the first team and the professionals and the reserves. And then in the afternoon, I used to go into the gymnasium and, and practice skills and technique with the youth team because, you know, I was in a, uh, in a gymnasium with the likes of Dean McNabb and, and Glenn Hoddle and people like that. And their, their ability on the ball was so good. And um, I knew I had a lot to do to catch up. Um, if I could ever catch up but then I didn't realise how good Glenn Hoddle was so I was never ever going to catch up with him <laughs> but um, the skills and techniques they had were amazing and that's when I did think you know I've only been playing soccer three years and these guys have been playing it all their lives you know so there was a lot for me to do but I re- realised after three or four months very quickly that um, I had other skills and attributes that were going to be my strengths for the future and um, I looked at the uh, at what the other players you know, could do, and Glenn had the ability to pass a ball with either foot, you know, and I was predominantly right-footed just then, um, but I was strong, I was quick, I had a great attitude and determination, and uh, those were the attributes that I made work for me, and uh, then I developed them, and I got better, obviously, as um, as I, I, I progressed, I got better skills and, and touch uh, improve with, with practice, but if you're not quick, and you're not strong. You're never going to be quick, and you're never going to be strong. So I made them work for me. Absolutely. Great stuff. Um, what about on a personal level? How difficult was it coming from, from Northern Ireland to the UK, as it, or to England, London in particular, as a young lad, and keeping your head down and focusing on what it is you wanted to do? Because it's easy to get distracted by the big city. It's a completely different world, isn't it? Well, I'd never been to London before. I'd only been to England once before, I think the year before when I was with Bangor on tour. Um, So, yeah, it was... uh you're, you're, you're like uh, you know, you're stuck in the, the traffic lights and the, the, you know you're you're you don't know what to do with yourself and and um, but after a period of time the fact that you're playing football and training every day and getting fitter you, you start to learn and it does take time to settle down into a new country but you know you have to understand Northern Ireland was not a, a particularly nice place to live back in the, the mid 70s it was a it was a difficult place to live and I had this opportunity and I wanted to make the most of it so uh, it took me nearly six months. To actually break through into the first team and um, thankfully I did and uh, then the following summer Spurs went on a world tour and uh, Glenn Hoddle and myself were picked to go on the tour and we were roommates and uh, we travelled to Canada and then down through America and to Los Angeles and then went to Hawaii and Fiji and New Zealand and Australia and uh, we 
played like nine games over a five week period and I got some experience playing football with the first team and um, Glenn obviously was he was an unbelievable talent you just couldn't believe how good he was with either foot and um, that was the start of you know the rest of my career so I just progressed gradually every year after that I progressed even though I'm an Arsenal supporter I can appreciate what a fantastic player Glenn Hoddle was and I don't think there's any question about that um, you know yeah. he's a pundit nowadays we see a lot of him on the TV um, listen to his views and you can tell that Glenn Hoddle is a uh, a student of the game I guess that's a good way of putting it yeah what was he like to share a room with as a character was he very similar to the way he is now in terms of sort of you know his views and stuff or do you think he's sort of changed over time um, Glenn was always very quiet spoken and he wasn't big headed and um, I know I've heard some great stories about him over the years but you know and, and I, I can um, react to a situation where in the gymnasium one day Peter Shreves was the coach and he had asked us to chip a ball into the uh, it was a circle on the wall and then before the ball hit the ground you had to go in and control it on your chest and then shoot into the goal at the bottom of the gymnasium and Glenn sort of when he asked Glenn to do the demonstration and I thought that this was a fairly difficult skill to make sure it hit the centre of the circle and also it didn't hit the ground I thought this is a difficult skill and, and Glenn asked him if he wanted him to use his right foot or his left foot <laughs> I thought he was having a laugh and uh, he chipped it with his right foot and controlled it on his chest and then volleyed it in the top corner with his left foot and I went wow and it was like okay that's the skill follow that and I thought how do you follow that you can't follow that you know because he just had this natural ability but, but for Glenn it was a natural ability but not for for the average footballer or, or even the special footballer Glenn had a talent but he also had the vision and the brain to go with it he could see passes that nobody else could see and he was just so far ahead of his time and it wasn't until 1978 when Ozzy Ardiles arrived in from Argentina after winning the World Cup um, and he's, his English was okay at the start but he got better over a period of time and um, he then started to talk about Glenn and saying you know if Minotti had Glenn Hoddle he would build a team around him. He's that good. So we knew then that Aussie could see the talent that maybe a lot of other people didn't see. But in England in 76, 77, 78, you have to understand that um, the technique and skill in football wasn't as important as being strong and, and robust. Yeah. You know, there was, there, every team, you know, in, in the middle of the park, they always had to have somebody who could make the tackles and uh, the Brian Robson type players who had the great engine. But Glenn was someone of vision and he was so, so special. It was untrue. But I don't think that the, the, the British fans appreciated him until probably 1980, 81, 82, yeah. you know. No, I agree with that. And I think when you look at certain players and you look at the, their style, you probably think that somebody like Glenn Hoddle, I know he went on to play abroad for a little while, but would have had yeah. more appreciation had he played in Serie A or in La Liga, for example, because yeah. there is more emphasis on those those parts of the game. Um, Jerry, when I mentioned to a few people that you'd be joining us today, um, the first thing that come up was that goal versus Spain in the 82 World Cup. Can you talk us through it? <laughs> Everybody talks about the goal against Spain in 1982. I'm sure they do. <laughs> because it was such an important goal, and it was probably, you know, um, if you look at the situation, you know, we had drawn against uh, Yugoslavia 0 0. We drew with Honduras 1 1 1. We probably should have won the Honduras game. Um, and that was the plan to win the Honduras game and look for a draw against Spain. But it meant when we played Spain, we had to beat them to qualify. And uh, then not only did we qualify, but we also won the group. Um, but it was one of those where no one really gave us any chance of, of qualifying. And we had uh, an inner determination and belief. And Martin O'Neill was the captain of the team. And we had Pat Jennings in goal, which was, you know, Pat was the best goalkeeper in the world, in my opinion, for six or seven years and a really solid back four uh, Jimmy Nickel and um, uh, he was playing at uh, right back Mal Donahue was the left back and then you had John McClelland and who was very quick and pacey which people didn't really uh, see and John had this long stride he could cover the ground a bit like David O'Leary you know that type of player who mm -hmm. long stride and of course big Chris Nickel who was like six foot four and very good in the air and he was the other centre half so the back four was really solid and nobody could, to, could uh, really score that many goals against us we were very well organised 
organised. And then the midfield was Sammy McElroy, David McCreary, Martin O'Neill, and myself. I played on the right hand side of midfield. And then up front it was Norman Whiteside and Billy Hamilton. So the team had a really good shape and balance about it. And David McCreary was just unbelievable for um, destroying and breaking up attacks. He always got a foot in, he always managed, he was fantastic for getting his foot in and breaking up attacks. And Martin had an unbelievable brain and Sammy had brilliant skills and technique and I had a powerhouse in terms of <clears throat> I could get up and down the field and cover the ground I had good athleticism so the, the balance was good and up front Billy Hamilton was a target man and Norman Whiteside coming on the scene as a 17 year old the youngest player ever to play in the World Cup he was unbelievable you had thought he was like in his 20s but he was only just turned 17 and had a great left foot and had great strength and presence and uh, technique so there was so much uh, to be added into the, the team that people didn't really see. But we knew we had a good shape about ourselves. We had fantastic shape. And um, I have to say that the team worked really well. But Martin had a, a team meeting um, the, the, the day before. And he called us together and said, look, he said, you know, this is how I see the game. He said, Spain um, are under more pressure than us. And he said, uh, it's the home game. They ex are expected to win. And he said, they'll be coming at us in the first 15, 20 minutes. He said, but we'll do what we're always good at. And he said, that's getting behind the ball and making it difficult for them. And he said, and we will then gradually come into the game and create our own attacks he said we'll have you know some chances he said all we have to do is put one of them away he said we'll beat them 1-0 and that was the day before the game brilliant stuff brilliant stuff and and I've watched the goal back and I've watched the the highlights back and I mean the ball just literally fell to you didn't it keep on bit yeah, of a mistake I got but. lucky you always need to be lucky to be honest Harry because you know I had knocked the ball out wide to Billy Hamilton on a run and I was looking to get forward and I thought well Billy <clears throat> he wasn't renowned for his, his great crossing ability from the right hand side and he had Tendilio to get past as well and I thought um I'm not going to burst to get into the box for this cross, but he put in a fantastic cross. It was such a good cross that attempted arcing out of the goalkeeper to come for it. And then he palmed it straight out towards me. And I just was arriving as he palmed it out to me. So there was a lot of good fortune. And then I kept it low and it had to go through several sets of legs before it hit the back <laughs> of the net. You know, so you always need a bit of good fortune when you're scoring goals. Absolutely. But you've got to be there to score it. That's the point, isn't it? <laughs> yep. That's true. That is true. But um, I, it's just a bit of fate. I think it was meant to be. That that was fated that we were meant to be there and we were meant to win the group and we were meant to play Austria and then France in the quarterfinals. You know, those are the sort of things. And that's what history is made of. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, after your, your time at Tottenham, you spent some time at Watford, um, but then you went on to join at Real Mallorca. Now, yeah. Was that tough considering you'd scored that goal against Spain? Did you feel like a bit of a, a, a bit of an enemy, a public enemy for doing that? Well, I, I was thinking that when I got to Mallorca, but <clears throat> I found out when I got to Mallorca, Mallorca's an island and they're very, very uh, much an independent sort of people. They have their own language. Mallorquin is a different language to Spanish, to Castellano. And um, I got there and... Uh, they, they loved the fact that I was a different type of centre forward. They didn't want a centre forward who was nimble and who uh, would skip it in and out of challenges and stick the ball in the back of the net. They wanted someone who was a big target man who could rough it up with the centre halves. A British style centre forward and that's why they signed me. And um, I was welcomed with open arms and uh, I really enjoyed it and settled in very quickly. And, um, you know, I scored my first goal for Real Mallorca against Barcelona. And in that Barcelona team was Maradona and Schuster and Carrasco and Alessanco. And uh, they had uh, Miguel. They had a, an unbelievable team. So I scored my first goal for them at uh, uh, in Mallorca and Palma at uh, the Louis Sitjar. I scored with a header at the far post and put his 1-0 up against the run of play. But um, I think that annoyed Maradona and he went <laughs> to another gear and he was just unbelievable and I mean unbelievable he was amazing and he destroyed as we get beaten 4-1 and uh, he was the man of the match without a shadow of a doubt 
but uh, that was my first real introduction to Spanish football and I found out very quickly that Spanish football was totally different to British football and uh, the, the centre halves and the um, you know our, our, our captain was a guy called Rafael Gallardo and he was the centre half from Andalusia and he was very tall and elegant and he had so much ability on the ball he had skill and technique you know and he wasn't really a great tackler but he could he could win the ball and, and start attacks and counter-attacks and he was just a very technically good gifted footballer but most of the players were and uh, you could see that the technique and skills was much better than it was when I played in in the UK so um, that's that was when I started finding out all about Spanish football and uh, Obviously, when I started working for Sky in 1995, I tried to explain to people that uh, technically um, Spanish football is much better than, than the, the yeah. Premier League and, the, and, and, the, and the, 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 the first division. I said, because these guys <clears throat> have got so much ability. And I tried to talk. And then my job at working at Sky was to explain to the, the people at home, the viewers, that... Um, the likes of Deportivo and Celta de Vigo, who were big clubs then and doing really well tactically. They were great to watch for me. And the star man in 1995, 96 was Rivaldo. And Rivaldo yes. had a sweet left foot and he had all the skill and technique in the world. And I did a feature on him uh, for one of the games. And then uh, on Celta Vigo, I covered Alexander Mostovoy, who was yes. such a talented uh, Russian international but he had there was Valerie Carpine as well was another one he was so technically gifted but there were so so many good players if you go back to Deportivo you had Jalminia who was just sensational left foot and created from midfield they were, it was exciting and I tried to portray the Spanish football and, and people started watching it and understanding this is great entertainment because they are technically gifted and they do take chances and they have got uh, other abilities so you know we, we, we moved forward like 20 odd years and um I think Spain is now the, the breeding ground for the players of the future for the Premier League. You know, Pep Guardiola has been nipping in and out for Manchester City and picking, you know, the stars for Manchester City. It's been the same for Manchester United, for, for Tottenham, for, for Arsenal, for all the, the, the big clubs. They've come in and saw the talent in Spain and brought them across to play in the Premier League. Absolutely. It is an incredible league. It's an incredible competition. And I definitely miss it being on Sky because... Oh, me too. I mean, not because I can't watch it, because, you know, if you really want to watch it, you can watch it. But it's it's having that convenience, you know. It's Sunday evening. You've spent all day watching your own team. You've, you're, you're stressed out from that. And the perfect way to unwind was to watch a nice uh, technical game of football. And I really, really do miss that, I've got to say. Um, Jerry, yeah. you mentioned Diego Maradona there. Um, um, I don't know if yeah. you've seen it, but there's a, have you seen the new documentary style film? It's fantastic. Unbelievable, it's fantastic. isn't it? It is fantastic. You know, and he was a talent. Now, Glenn Hoddle and I had a discussion a couple of months ago, I was speaking to Glenn on the phone, and I phoned for five minutes for a chat, and we ended up on the phone for about 45 minutes because he was saying to me, like, Maradona for me, he thinks he's the best player in the world. And I went, look, I said, I said, he's not as good as Messi. I said, what Messi's done? He said, yeah, but hold on. Maradona has, he's went to Napoli and he won a league title there single-handedly and he's done. And I said, I know, and he says, and Maradona's won, won a World Cup. He said, you know, he said, uh, obviously, he said, Messi hasn't won a World Cup. And I said, well, if you want to go down that route, I said, then I'll go to George Best. I said, George Best, you know, he had lumps kicked out of him in his ear. I said, but tactically, and uh, the, the ability he had, you know, so we, we had all these discussions going on. It was great. And it's fantastic when you get talking to people, you know, mates and, and stuff who have great knowledge of football that you can discuss all the great players of the world. And uh, there's so many opinions. And that's what football's all about. It's about opinions. And, uh, everybody has their own but it's great to watch the stars it is great Maradona was amazing and I played against him several times um, uh, at Barcelona and obviously in Mallorca but um, he was a great guy he was a great character to uh, to speak with and, and to be out with and uh, I have to say I've been very fortunate to be able to play against and and talk to people like Maradona absolutely and and for me watching that film because I'm one of these people that Diego Maradona was before my time. Um, but for me, there's something about Diego Maradona, the aura, the character that attracts me to, to watch him and to, you know, I've watched lots of documentaries about him. I've read books about him. I've watched that film. I actually went and watched that film twice. Um, but for me, there's something about that character that makes you gravitate towards him. And it's really sad the way it all ended for him though, doesn't it? I mean, I had a tear in my eye watching yeah. the end of that film. 
Yeah, because he was so special. And it was like, you know, the, the, the Argentinian people took him into their heart and they just loved him. They loved him to bits. And he loved them and he, he always tried to deliver. But, you know, he was such a good player. I remember when he played in Spain. And obviously I was playing in Spain at the same time. And he was so good. The only way you could stop him was by kicking him. And that's why I reverted back to George Best because the only way you could stop George was by kicking him. And um, they both had this unbelievable ability. And George could turn, like, to the left, and he would be 45-degree angle, and you'd think he's going to fall over. But he, he didn't. He had this fantastic balance. And he, he had two feet, and he'd go past people, and he'd skip over tackles. Now, Maradona only had one foot. It was all left foot. But, boy, did he make that work for him. If you put it on his right foot, he could curl his left foot right and control it and move off to the left all in one movement I'd never seen that before and I thought oh my god how do you stop him and the only way you could stop him was by kicking him so um, uh, and in those days obviously it was a lot more physical the game um, and maybe that's why you know Messi in the last 10 12 years for me has been such a superstar because you know he's small but he has unbelievable ability and he has been scoring goals with his left foot and his right foot now I just love to watch him play he is a he is a genius but he wasn't getting kicked like Maradona was and George Best was so those are the arguments that Glenn and I had and it is they're, they're good arguments and it would make a great discussion sometime with a lot of people in a room but um, you know people will always discuss that who was the best Absolutely, absolutely. And it is a great debate. You're absolutely right. Um, Jerry, just going to put a couple of listener questions to you that we've had fired at us um, ahead of this show. Uh, This first one comes from Stephen Oliver. Uh, He says, as a Northern Ireland fan, can you ask Jerry what he thinks of our chances of Euro 2020 qualification? Well... Michael O'Neill is the manager and Michael had set out a plan and you know I speak to Michael and Jimmy Nichols obviously one of his coaching staff and Jimmy's very close friend of mine and I speak to Jimmy and Michael got a belief into that team the Northern Ireland team and he planned that we would play there was obviously when you've got the Dutch and you've got Germany in your group you think oh my god you know one of them would have been tough but to have the both of them so we've got the situation where Michael didn't want to play them first so we played the lesser sides and uh, the Belarus and, and the Slovenia first so we played both of them um, home and away and we've won all four games so we sit top of the group with 12 points and our next game is coming up obviously is going to be Germany on the 9th of September with, at Windsor Park which is a big game now, they all said, well, when Germany comes, you're going to be in trouble. And I said, listen, we played Germany in 1982-83 in the, the Nations League. And we beat them 1-0 in Belfast when Ian Stewart scored. And then um, six months later in Hamburg, you know, they said, well, when you go to Germany, you won't be so lucky. And we beat them 1-0 in Hamburg. And Norman Whiteside scored the winner there. So I think we're the only team in the world has played Germany home and away in any World Cup or Nations, European Nations competition and one home and away. So we believe that we can cause an upset in Windsor Park. We can beat anybody, I think, at Windsor Park if you get yourself organized. And Michael is the man to do that, I believe. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be a cracking game. And uh, it'll be a huge game, obviously. But we've got the Dutch to come. We've got to go and play them as well. So I think Northern Ireland have a fantastic chance of qualifying. Brilliant stuff. Fingers crossed they do. Uh, Fingers crossed they make it. Um, This is a question from Dan DeLuca. He says, what is Barcelona's plan for life without Messi? Recent big signings have been a little bit underwhelming. Is La Masia still capable of providing the talent that can dominate Europe? Good question. Well, well, Messi's still playing, obviously. And he's come back. And I was looking forward to seeing him play. Um, The other night I was... Um, covering the game and he didn't play because he he had an injury he picked up an injury but um, they still got a fantastic squad they've got a strong squad you've got Griezmann has come in and I'm looking forward to see how Griezmann fits in that front three uh, with uh, with Barcelona Um, see his question about La Masia is a brilliant question because I've asked the same question myself over the last four or five years you know um, Sergio Roberto is the last player to come out of La Masia and come into the first team and he was a midfield player and he's end up, he ends up playing more as a right back um, for Barcelona but he, he doesn't play nobody plays as a right back for Barcelona Dani Alves never played as a right back for Barcelona jo, uh, Jordi Alba doesn't play as a left back they are attacking wing backs and they like to keep 
control of the ball and pass it. And you know, it'll be the normal style of football. And Barcelona are the the, the team that everybody's going to have to beat. But I think it'll be a tougher race this year for Barcelona because of the strength and depth and the signings that Atletico Madrid have made. And they've done really well, as I spoke about earlier. But um, no, um, it's it's funny because La Masia was just an institution where they produced player after player. I mean, Andres Iniesta was probably my favourite player over the last seven or eight years when he played for Barcelona. And before that, you had Pep Guardiola and you had Xavi and you had all these superstars who were coming through from La Masia and they don't seem to be producing them as readily now. There hasn't been too many stars come out of La Masia in the last three or four years. So it's a concern. It really is. But they're a huge club. Um, Barcelona and uh, you know it's uh, I think they've still got some some strength and depth but uh, not to the extent that they used to have yeah I, I agree with that I agree with that assessment uh, Steve asks how did Barcelona well how did Pep Guardiola's great Barcelona side compare with Pep Guardiola's Manchester City side <laughs> Well, you know, Pep Guardiola, um, he was an amazing player when he played for Barcelona and we sung his praises, he and Xavi and, and uh, all the other skillful, talented players they had. But when he became a manager and he was the manager of the reserve team and um, he actually managed um, Messi when he was a reserve, you know, when he was 17, 18, 19. And he helped Messi, you know, to keep his feet on the ground. But um, he knew, I mean, I read the book that Game wrote, wrote and uh, after his uh, three years, went in virtually everything that he could. You know, as a manager, he's made a, an unbelievable impact. And he, I think he changed the face of football. You know, I'm watching goalkeepers now getting the ball at the back. And it doesn't matter whether it's Juventus, and I, I covered them the other day, or it doesn't matter um, which goalkeeper it is, whether it's an Arsenal goalkeeper, you know, or what league they're playing in. All the goalkeepers have to be good on the ball with their feet and, and be the last man. And Pep started that off. He started it off. And I thought, you know, when I was with Graham Taylor, it was like, you, you don't take chances as a goalkeeper yeah. is, is there to, to save the ball. He's not there to use his feet too often. But um, he would never have, have liked what Pep did. But Pep started a revolution. And now everybody's followed suit. And it's changed football to a great degree. And, um, you know, you take your hat off to Pep. So, you know, I thought as a player... Pep was an incredible player, but he's become even more incredible as a manager. And it's very rarely you could say that. There's not too many managers in the world who were sensational players and become even bigger as a coach. So I take my hat off to Pep Guardiola and have a lot of respect for him. Great stuff. And just a final question to you, Jerry. This one comes from Lee. He says... Who's the best player you've ever played with and the best player you've ever played against? And I know this is going to be really difficult, but I'm going to throw it to you anyway. <laughs> right, well, you know, I, I only played a couple of games with George Best and George was absolutely sensational, I have to tell you. I was in awe when I made my debut for Northern Ireland against West Germany. And uh, I played up front. Danny Blanchard said, Jerry, you're playing up front today. You're making your debut. and It'll be you and George Best up front. And I thought, no way. You know, because to play with George was unbelievable. And he became, obviously, a very good friend of mine in the years to come. But uh, it was special. I'd have to say, you know, over the years I played uh, football, Glenn Hoddle was just... Something, something else. He was so special; it was untrue. And uh, Glenn was just a special, special talent too. Was not totally recognised, I don't think. And I played with the likes of John Barnes, who was another sensational player. You know, John was fantastic, but Glenn, Glenn was in a league of his own. You know, and playing against, I played against Platini, I played against Cruyff. You know, and um, I played against Maradona. So it'd have to be Maradona would be the best I played against, without a shadow of a doubt. Um, he was just he, he could win the game on his own and he did he did very often do that <laughs> so those are the players and I've been fortunate to play against some fantastic players brilliant stuff Jerry thank you so so much for your time I can't explain in words how much I've enjoyed this interview it's been absolutely brilliant and I'm sure our listeners will too listen my pleasure Harry um, great to speak to you that was the brilliant Jerry Armstrong. Don't forget to like, subscribe, share, comment, review. You know the drill by now. And we'll be back very soon with another edition. Until then, take care.